continually encouraged how God prepares a way and makes a way when it looks like there is no way. Even from the verse that David shared before the space of music, of coming to his bold, his throne boldly with our concerns and our situations. Why do we have access to the Father? Because he spent time in the garden. He spent time in that garden of Gethsemane, speaking to the Father, and many hours of prayer to where he actually sweat drops of blood and agony over the situation of what he had to do so we could have forgiveness. And he asked basically, is there a plan B? And there is no plan B, it was plan A. Accomplish the Father's will. That was planned before the foundation of the world. And he did it so that we can have eternal life. And in the garden is the title that I got a week and a half ago or whatever, and I thought my thoughts were something until he changes your thoughts while you're sitting there and throughout the morning and things like that. Yesterday, as I pondered the theme and thinking about gardens, growing up we had gardens to survive. We would actually, we had friends that allowed us to put a garden on their property because we lived in town and we had no property to have a garden. And they were kind enough to let us come and cultivate the soil, put the seed in, care for the garden, and get a harvest. And one of the families happened to be my wife's family. Another one was the Tom's family below Ben Franklin Road. And that's how the McMillan family survived. It was zucchini, squ zucchini and spaghetti squash and tomatoes and beets and whatever. We, but God provided a way. Am I sorry about that? No, I'm rejoicing about that. It was good for us. That gardening thing left my desire. I have not much desire to do that, but them really loves to do that. So we do a little garden. But a garden, there are a lot of concepts and comparisons of scriptures to that. And we're going to read, there's gardens mentioned from the Garden of Eden to gardens that they used in David's day and the vineyards and things they had to the Garden of Gethsemane till we get to go to where God is the everlasting fellowship in the Garden of Heaven. Whatever that entails, I don't know, nor do you, but it'll be beautiful. So what's some concepts? I drew this from Jeremiah 4, verse 3. When he's speaking to these men of Judah and Jerusalem, thus says the Lord to the men of Judah and Jerusalem, break up your fallow ground and sow not among the thorns. The Israelites were walking away from God. They had hard hearts. They were doing their own thing. They didn't have time for him, and they didn't care about spiritual things or worried about having their sins covered. I like that passage today. Our sins are forgiven now. Amen. That's a beautiful thing. Covering was a once a year thing. You had to go sacrifice that lamb at Passover. But our sins are gone because of the garden of the tomb, which is still there today. And it is an empty tomb, praise the Lord for that. But we have a cultivation that takes place. And he was admonishing them to change their heart and to change their ways. Well, let's start with the seed. What is, the, according to scriptures, the seed that we sow? It's the word of God. It's the gospel. It's the life-changing story. John 3.36. He that has the Son of God has life, and he that has not the Son of God has not life. Bottom line, it's not by works of righteousness that we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. So the seed is that. What do we got to do to get the seed in soil? You got to cultivate the ground. If you use this plot of ground behind us for a garden, you're going to have to start by changing the condition of the soil. How is the soil, and then the gospels, the sower and the seed, the soil is our heart. You either have a hard heart, or you have a stony heart, one that doesn't really have time or place for the seed to grow. Or you can get receive the seed and get caught up in thorns, and I can think that could refer to a believer that gets sidetracked and walks away from but the first thing is the road that the seed lands on and the birds take it away. You hear the gospel and you say, that isn't for me. I don't need that. I can make it on my own. And there's people like that. 
that they, they got it made by what they're doing, their good works, their community service, their generosity, their time spent, you know, in the church or whatever. But if they don't have that relationship with Christ, they're not going to be in eternity with Him. Now, how do you get this soft heart? Well, it's the work of the Holy Spirit. And you need to surrender your ways to Him. You're never sorry for anything you give God. So you got to have the right heart to receive the gospel. By grace are you saved through faith. Faith is something that we use sometimes recklessly. You had faith in those benches. You didn't check them out before you sat down. You had faith in your automobile to get you here and all those things. But the faith you'll never disappoint is the faith you put in God. He always provides what we need. It doesn't always look like a great provision. Sometimes it's a distraction. Sometimes it's an obstacle. But the seed is the Word of God. So it requires a choice of where do you want to plant the seed. Now, we knew enough about gardening that when you went and got the soil ready, you didn't just throw all the seeds in a bag and scatter them. You individually put things where they ought to be. I don't advise you planting your lettuce in the corn row. You're going to have a hard time later. You've got to take thought about areas of your life and where you ought to be sharing the seed. And, you know, that's our responsibility. It's God's responsibility to provide the harvest. So just scatter the seed and share it where you need to, and God will work on hearts. But there is the cultivation, there is the changing of the condition of the heart, there is a reception of it, and then after we become believers, you're in the garden. If you're not in God's garden, you've got a problem. As you think of the Garden of Eden, that's the fall of man, where Adam and Eve disobeyed God. When you think of the Garden of Gethsemane, there's the forgiveness available. You're allowed to, you have the opportunity to get a new beginning, a new start, and to reap a different harvest than you were going to reap. And I'll read that passage as we shared last Sunday, the same passage that deals with if you sow to the flesh, you reap corruption. If you sow to the spirit, you reap life everlasting. That, you know, that's provided at the Garden of Gethsemane and the garden where Jesus prayed and paid the price for our sin. So you have that, changing that transition to give us the fellowship. You cannot have fellowship with the Father until you have His Son, Jesus Christ. That's the way that it is. You'll never understand the Scriptures until you know the author. And when you know Jesus, He'll let you, you only understand a, just a basic knowledge. You aren't going to get it until you see that who Jesus is and you receive Him. And those of us who are believers, that's the best news you can give anybody. That is the hope of eternal life. What do you have to offer them for hope in this world? Hope your finances last till you get to the end of your story? Hope that the economy keeps going? Hope that you get your person in office you want? Hope that you get... There's all fading dreams. The hope of eternal life is a secure promise through the Word of God and the work of Christ. And you don't have to be ashamed of that. So the challenge today is have you received Christ? Yes. Are you willing to share that good news without two others? You might be here today and thought, man, I never heard that before. Just what is the gospel? It is, as Romans chapter 10 verse 9 says, that if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus raised from the dead, you will be saved. With the mouth, confession is made known unto salvation. You ask Christ for forgiveness. That's all you do. And you do it in however way you need to do it. You know, the thief on the cross had a prayer that really didn't make a whole lot of sense to us. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. They all were dying. Who's going to be king when they all die? He had faith that Jesus was who he said he was. And from the things, no doubt, that he saw and heard in that area, that he put his faith and trust into the promised Messiah. And he thought, this is the Messiah, and he believed. My prayer was, Lord Jesus, I have sinned and I'm sorry. I believe you died on the cross for me. Forgive me and give me eternal life. I've heard young people say, God, I blew it. 
and I need forgiven. Do they get saved? Yes. When you call upon the name of Lord Jesus, forgive me for my sin, he's saying, you're in the family. I won't remember that anymore. When you sincerely cry from your heart to the Lord, he will hear you, and then he knows you by name. What John shared really spoke to my heart whenever Mary's all concerned and that someone stole Jesus and she didn't know where he was for her to put spices on. When he called her name, that settled the issue. They had a conversation before he said that. You know, whom seekest thou? And she explained. Then she, he said, Mary. He knows your name. He knows everything about you. And you can have confidence and rest in that. We have a great God who can do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. So I pray that everyone here is in the garden of Christ, in the family of God. If you're not, don't leave here without asking to be in the family. Ask Jesus to forgive you and give you a new life. Be prepared. It's going to change, but it's going to get exciting. And it's going to be an adventure, and the devil's not going to like it. He does not like that at all. But he's a loser. Read the last chapters. You'll see what happens to him. Let's have a closing prayer. Father, thank you for your love to us. Thank you for your plan that you sent Jesus, your only begotten son, to come into this fallen world and to go through what he went through in those agonizing days and events of a crucifixion so that we could have forgiveness in that garden tomb area. And we're glad that it's an empty tomb still to this day. We're glad that he has made access to you who dispenses all the blessings and all the things we need in life. Help us to seek your throne when we need mercy and grace in time of need. Father, as those of us who are believers, may we see our responsibility. May we lay aside our plans and our selfish agendas to reach out to those that are lost. Be with those that might need to trust you as Lord and Savior to take this moment and ask you in their way, and however that is, for forgiveness and to receive Jesus into their heart. And we commit that to you. You're the one who saves. You're the one who plants the seed and allows them to make that choice by faith. Uh, give us a good remainder of this service as we conclude it with song. And as the food has been prepared, we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen.